good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Jack's Live. I'm your host, Rick Huntress, Director of Business Development at the Jackson Laboratory, and today I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Andy Sheely, Senior Scientific Advisor at the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, good morning for you, Andy, I think it is, right? Yeah, it is. Good morning, everyone. So as a reminder to our audience, please be sure to use the comments box to submit your questions, add a comment, and of course, send us a shout out from wherever you are watching us in the world today. We'll answer as many of the questions as we can when we get to the end of our live stream discussion today. So today our topic is gonna to be about working with aged mice. And so Andy, I thought before we got too far into the conversation, uh, what are equivalent ages for young, middle-aged and, and old mice and then you know, as a, as a start, what, what are some of the advantages of working with aged mice? Yeah, these are very good questions, Rick, um, especially for those who maybe haven't worked with aged mice before and are uh, typically uh, accustomed to working with younger animals. So a lot of experiments involving mice uh, will involve younger animals, say six to eight weeks of age. And uh, that, that roughly works out to uh, adolescence, I would say. But as uh, mice age, uh, there are some rough uh, equivalencies that can be assigned to, uh, that, that map to, um, to human aging. So by the time a mouse is roughly about a year old, um, by some estimations, that's roughly equivalent to a person in their early 40s. And by the time a mouse is about a year and a half old, that might be a, a rough correspondence to an individual perhaps in, in their late 50s. So by some estimations, you can map out uh, different life stages on human aging onto the mouse. And so there are some very interesting uh, changes that occur with aging in laboratory mice. So I'm principally talking about the inbred C57 black 6 j strain here because we have a lot of experience uh, working with this mouse model, okay. uh, particularly in the context of aging. And um, so, uh, so there's the interesting thing about working with the aged animals is that you can have a translationally relevant age of disease onset because as we know, age is a major risk factor for many human uh, diseases, right? So we see some things, uh, some changes with aging in laboratory mice that can include uh, uh, insulin resistance, uh, glucose intolerance, sarcopenia, changes in immune cell populations. So for example, uh, what we can see in um, C57 black 6J mice as they age is that you can see decreases in the population of naive immune cells like T cells and so the naive immune cells, of course, are the ones that are capable of recognizing novel antigens. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is of interest so in, in the context of uh, human aging because similar things are seen in the elderly population, which can make uh, a vaccine response uh, less effective in the elderly. And so if we see similar things playing out in the, in the in inbred C57 black 6J mice as they age, uh, that, that uh, presents a, a new or novel platform for maybe trying to understand some of these age-related changes in the immune population. Uh, we can also see declines in the um, uh, sort of the, um, the sensory systems as well. So there can be um, losses uh, in visual, olfactory, and uh, in hearing senses in mice as they age. Uh, and um, another uh, uh, nice thing that has been worked out by some research at the Jackson Laboratory is that uh, the, there's a frailty index that is very useful for understanding um, uh, aging in, in mice, and it takes into account a variety of different age-related changes, and, and it correlates really nicely with body temperature in certain circumstances. So I have a really great reference if anybody's interested in learning more about that. Yeah, Andy, that's really great information and, and not necessarily surprising that an older mouse would respond differently than a younger mouse. So when, when we go from, say, normal aging into disease models, what are some of the types of experiments that actually might turn out differently if you ran a similar study looking at both young and older mice? Yeah, um, so we, we've done some recent research on this, and there's there's quite a bit that's been described in the literature as well. But one of the um, interesting new findings that, that we've made um, is, is looking at mouse models of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which of course is a major complication of type 2 diabetes in, in the clinic affecting the liver. Right. And uh, so for example, um, C57 black 6J mice are frequently used for diet-induced uh, models of metabolic disease. Right. And so one of the common models for, for NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, involves feeding mice a diet that's high in fat, fructose, and cholesterol. And what happens is if this diet is fed to mice at a life stage that roughly corresponds to the age of diagnosis in the clinic, so um, uh, people around 40 to 60 years of age, or, or that's the typical age when NASH is diagnosed clinically, 
if you induce these models in a mouse that's roughly equivalent to that age, so a mouse that's about a year old, what you can find is that there's a, a much more severe and uh, rapid uh, onset of NASH-like symptoms in, in, in this animal uh, when it's when the diet is fed to them from a uh, starting at a life stage that's you know roughly more approximate to the clinical age of diagnosis. Um, there, uh, I mentioned earlier that there are some changes in immune cell populations, right? right? So um, you see the decrease in the abundance of naive immune cells, and so this is especially relevant for. Um, some of the mouse models that are used to understand response to immune checkpoint inhibitors in cancer. So, for example, it's it's known in um, various uh, types of um, so solid tumors, for example, clinically, that um, older patients tend to respond better to uh, PD-1 inhibition, so as a uh, kind of a hallmark uh, type of immune checkpoint inhibitor. And uh, that's thought to be related to changes in regulatory T cells that are found in the tumor. And when these models are run, um, say, for example, in a C57 black 6 j syngeneic cancer model, where it's a black 6 tumor growing in a black 6 mouse, is that there can be, depending on the tumor type, there can be different responses when the mouse is, uh, say, for example, at a, a more middle-aged or elderly life uh, stage, so something in between, you know, a year and a year and a half of age, is that um, depending on the tumor model, uh, you can actually see um, responses that are more effective than when the model is uh, run in a uh, in, in a younger animal. And again, this is uh, tied back to uh, physiologically relevant changes in the, um, in the immune system. Um, and I, I mentioned earlier, there's some changes in, in neuro behavior as well. Uh, so, um, you, you know, we've, we've uh, done a lot of research to try to understand how um, cognitive tasks and functions change uh, with mice as they age. And so um, uh, obviously that could have some relevance for, for neurobehavioral research as well. Yeah, I think that, you know, to me, that would be a natural place where you'd expect differences. We, we see changes in, in people, memory and, and behavior as they get older. But going back to your, your comments about uh, tumor studies, looking at the effectiveness of drugs, is it also the case that side effects like CRS or other things would be different in aged mice? I, I guess the assumption would be that they would be if, if treatment response is different than potentially um, side effect response could be different too? Yes, that's exactly right. So um, CRS, cytokine release syndrome. Um, uh, yeah, so there are, some, there are some differences in response to biologics when these uh, um, tumor models are induced in older animals. Uh, there are, um, b beyond just cytokine release, um, we uh, have some done some recent research at the Jackson Laboratory to show that aged mice respond differently just to conventional chemotherapeutics where they can have a greater oh, okay. uh, toxi sure. toxicity in um, aged animals. And so uh, when you have this kind of more sensitive platform, it, it could be very useful for trying to understand how for example, immune checkpoint inhibitors might work in combination with some of the more conventional treatments like chemotherapy. So Andy, let's let's um, shift gears a little bit here. Um, we kind of made the case that there, there are certain applications where, where aged mice are gonna be really important. What would be some of the challenges that a group or a researcher would wanna consider when they're, they're gonna start looking at, at trying to age mice or integrate aging mice into their studies? Yeah, that's actually a very good uh, a, a question to ask, Rick, because uh, an aged mouse will look and behave quite differently from a younger animal. Um, so, for example, as uh, mice age, there are some um, kind of striking changes in their appearance overall, where by the time a mouse is, say, a year and a half or two years of old, you can have some changes in the, uh, in the, in the color of the fur. So, for example, in the C57 black 6J mouse, you can have some, some graying and particularly some thinning of fur. And so if you're not used to seeing uh, an aged animal, it can be kind of a striking um, observation. I'm just it's laughing in because there's a little graying and, and thinning going on here as well. So yeah. I guess we have that. Yeah, it happens to mice too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, there are some other age-related uh, observations that you don't necessarily see in younger animals. So for example, C57 black 6J males um, in particular are kind of prone to becoming obese, even on a chow diet. So you can find some animals that, that look rather obese. And so uh, as, as they get older, you can also find development of uh, inguinal hernias, which you don't typically see in younger mice. And on some very rare occasions, you can see um, some uh, tumors that develop. I guess that's particularly, um, so these right. are mouse tumors that are developing, uh, particularly with age. Um, the, the types of cancers that, that we see in aged C57 black 6J mice are gonna be, um, so soft tissue cancers like sarcomas, uh, lymphomas and other um, hematological malignancies. 
So um, yeah, there's rare seizures that can happen in some of these aged animals. And uh, in, in general, we find, um, it, so we have these very large aging colonies at, at the Jackson Laboratory where we set um, mice aside at weaning and, and um, age them up specifically to these different life stages, like a year, year and a half, all the way up to 90 weeks. And that we find that these mice overall um, tend to have uh, very, um, we have good success in aging them up to these, these time points. Again, typically the oldest age that we keep uh, in, in our colonies is up to 90 weeks. But of course, for some sort of uh, longevity study, for example, you may uh, require to, um, aging mice out to you know, natural uh, endpoints. Um, and uh, so overall that we find that with a, a particularly like a well-enriched cage environment. So for example, um, if you include things like shelter type enrichment, that right. this helps to reduce some of the um, unwanted uh, um, uh, appearances that you can see sometimes in aging mice that can include things like barbering, um, uh, hair loss, whisker picking, et cetera. And so with a, with a um, well-enriched cage environment, you can help to reduce the incidence of some of these kind of unwanted um, conditions. Um, and so uh, overall, we don't tend to have too much issue with aggression in the aged mice in our colony, although others have sometimes reported that. And so I think that that really speaks to the importance of the kind of the enriched cage environment as a way to uh, to, to to try to reduce some of that. You know, it's interesting that I've, I've been involved in, in mouse genetics and mouse research long enough that the old dogma was that that you were single housing your males by the time you got to a, a, a certain age. And it sounds like with a little bit of proactive management and oversight, uh, you don't necessarily have to assume that. And I would think behaviorally isolated animals would, would be another complication of, of aging, mm -hmm. um, how they're socialized when, when you do that as well. Um, yeah. And go ahead, Andy. Oh, no, I, I was just going to point out that, you know, um, a, a lot of the research involving aging a animals um, will involve uh, male mice. Um, but we've had the chance to compare male and female mice and some of these different uh, uh, age-related disease models, because we, we do maintain colonies of aged males and females. Uh, one of the interesting things that we found is that, um, I, I'll come back to that diet-induced uh, metabolic disease model for NASH. Uh, so for example, if you have um, female mice that are the same age equivalent as say, for example, the, the male mice when they're set on this diet, um, so approximately one year, which again corresponds roughly to someone, in, an individual in their 40s, is that the male and the female mice respond um, virtually identically um, in this disease model where you have uh, elevations of markers of liver damage, cholesterol, development of fibrosis, et cetera. But if this model is run in a younger female, you don't see nearly the same response. So um, it it's sort of takes, a, you know, by having the availability of these colonies of, of aged males and females is that you can compare some of these um, uh, responses between the sexes. Very neat. Andy, we have a question that's coming in from uh, uh, our, our audience today, and I think it's a good one to, to introduce here now. It's where can someone find data on uh, studies looking at aged mice or, or older mice? Um, I know some resources, but I'm curious, where would you recommend uh, clients go if, if they want to get uh, data on aged mice? Yeah, that's actually a great question, Rick, and, and I'm always happy to highlight um, a fantastic resource that we host uh, at, on the Jackson Laboratory's uh, website. It's called the Mouse Phenome Database. I was and hoping what that's this, what you were going to suggest. Yeah. Yeah. So it, what it is, is it's a collection of quantitative data about principally inbred mouse strains, but there are some mutants in there as well. Uh, so, for example, you're going to find things related to, you know, um, kind of real practical uh, phenotypes like body weight or... Uh, complete blood counts, um, cholesterol, clinical chemistry panels, but you're also going to find data on longevity. So um, there, in particular, there are a couple of really good data sets that compare survival in different inbred mouse strains, both males and females. And um, so uh, you, can, you can find that data there. Uh, I believe the keyword to search for is longevity on the mouse phenome database. I think will take you directly to that. Uh, but I think that that's, that's a really great resource because not only can you look at the, the, the graphs and, and the figures that show the, um, you know, say, for example, survival curves, but you can actually look at the raw data as well if you want to do, uh, for example, um, power calculations to try to determine sample size. So it's very useful for that because you can get a sense for, you know, what you can expect in terms of you know, natural variation. Um, I, I found that to be particularly useful in designing experiments with aged mice. 
Great. I agree, Andy. I've, I've used that resource myself many times and um, it, it's, it's open source and uh, it's called the Mouse Phenome Database. We sometimes refer to it as MPD here at JAX. Um, and if you have any trouble finding it, let us know and we'll, we'll get you the link. Um, so Andy, for clients who are interested in, or researchers interested in working with um, aged mice, but may not have the space, the time to, to do aging themselves, um, getting a mouse out to 90 weeks obviously takes 90 weeks. So what are some of the options for folks who are interested in uh, working a bit more with aged mice? Yeah, so um, at the Jackson Laboratory, we distribute male and female aged mice up to 90 weeks of age, and um, right. we can supply uh, relatively large cohorts of these mice, which is nice if you wanted to have, say, for example, a larger study, if it's biomarker or longevity, um, something along these lines. Um, so that's the C57 Black 6J strain that we age up to that. Uh, we have some active research involving um, other strains. We're kind of exploring some possibilities with those as well. Um, but if there's, for example, um, you know, at the Jackson Laboratory, we don't just have C57 Black 6J. We have, you know, thousands of other mouse strains that are available from live colonies. Uh, in some cases, you can start those um, aging projects using retired breeders. Um, so right. these would be mice that are roughly around, depending on the strain, but you know, they could be six, seven months of age. Um, and then there's also custom aging projects that that, um, that we can do on your behalf. For example, if there's a particular strain that, uh, you know, you didn't uh, have the space or, or the desire to age up, you know, we could handle that that for you. Yeah, and I've certainly worked with clients who, who um, brought retired breeders in when it was strains that we didn't have an aging colony. I think the only adjustment folks have to make is understanding those aren't precisely timed animals. So sometimes there's an age range. We might get you 10 or 20 mice, but they might be between six and eight months of age, exactly like you were describing. It. Yeah, and um, I just had another thought is that um, uh, often what you can you, you can do is from, uh, if, you're, if you're say working with uh, aged mice from the Jackson laboratory is you can get younger animals of the same strain, C57 Black 6J that come from the same room environment. If for example, you wanted to try to control for some of those uh, sort of environmental factors as well. If you're comparing old and young mice. Very neat. Um, well, uh, first off, I want to give, uh, we've, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I want to give uh, a quick hello and thank you to uh, all of uh, folks who dialed in today, including folks from Australia, India, Chile, we've got California, Indiana, Maryland, um, hopefully a few of my friends from Boston and a few of yours from Southern California as well, Andy. Um, if we couldn't answer your questions today, uh, please uh, let us know that you're interested. We'll be sure to follow up. Uh, for more questions about model selection, you can reach out to us anytime. Uh, great resource is micetech at jax.org. That's M-I-C-E-T-E-C-H at J-A-X dot O-R-G. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you, Andy, for a great discussion. Yeah, it's my